Good evening, everyone. My name is Chris Hebert. I've been given the honor of introducing two very, very remarkable people uh, tonight. Um, this is a very special and exciting evening for me um, here at Mountain Cloud. And I'd like to talk for just a second about why I think this particular event is special. First of all, you'll note that there are a lot of cameras around. This is being sponsored and filmed by Tricycle Magazine, which is the largest, the oldest, probably the most widely read magazine uh, dedicated to contemporary uh, Buddhism, answering a single question. Why are Buddhism and Zen gaining so much interest these days in the West? How do meditation and Zen help us today? Tricycle has won the Folio Award three times as the best spiritual magazine in America. So they seem to think that this dialogue that we're going to have tonight might have some special significance. And when I think when you hear what the content is going to be, you'll be surprised. It's also won the uh, Utney Media Award in 2013. In short, tricycle um, is a symbol. And the tricycle is a bicycle with three wheels on it. And it's the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. And the Buddha are the teachers. And tonight we have two really remarkable teachers, both of whom I'm familiar with and I can vouch we're going to have an interesting, interesting time tonight. The second is the teaching itself. What they're going to speak on tonight um, is unique. I haven't heard anyone really talk about what they're going to talk about tonight. And then the third part of the tricycle is the community, which is the Sangha which is a community of like-minded people. And one of the things that I find really hopeful about Mountain Cloud is that since Henry has come in here, lots and lots of people have been coming, coming forward. And um, a sense of community is evolving from that. And um, there is an element of transmission, from my point of view, that comes from that sense of community when we sit together, when we practice together when we drink tea together. So tonight I'm honored to have two great teachers on a really, really great topic. They called it Returning to the Source. First is Stephen Batchelor. I um, have seen him, uh, I've had private docus on with him. Um, I, I, I can tell you in my heart he is compelling, he is compassionate, he is obviously quite famous. And if I was going to take one quote that I think really symbolizes where he stands, please, I forgive you if I've got a bad one, Stephen. But a constantly evolving culture of awakening rather than a religious system is how he describes Buddhism. I find him a troubadour for Buddhism as it's entering into a vital new phase in our, in our, in our community of exploring modern, um, the modern times, the 21st century. What does this stuff from thousands of years ago have to do with my life today? The other man sitting with him is Henry Schuchman, and um, he is also a really world-famous, award-winning author and poet. And uh, rather than talk about his biography, I'll tell you that I met him on a Southwest Airlines flight talking to a five-year-old. <laughs> and he, it, he blew my mind. He absolutely blew my mind. I was sitting eavesdropping on a conversation between an adult and a five-year-old. And uh, my life hasn't been the same uh, since then. <laughs> he really has brought Zen back alive for me, and he has walked me through some of the silliest questions, some of the silliest exercises that have been such huge breakthroughs for me that I can't even begin to share them with you. He entered the, the uh, Sanbo Zen uh, lineage. His current abbot is Yamada Royun, is that correct? <laughs> Roshi. 
uh, he's the resident teacher here now at Mountain Cloud. And um, I think he's an unbelievably terrific teacher. And I think that there is a huge difference between being awake and being a great teacher. Um, he's published all over the place. And um, you'll find him informal, if like me, humorous, wise, compassionate. If you're really, really lucky, you get to hear him in Taisho, and you get to have Kokosun with him. So the third leg that we have here is something that's really alive. It's the Sangha. Uh, there are many, many teachers that I know and respect in Santa Fe County and from around the country who very quietly visit here. And I think that's the greatest homage that a place can have. <clears throat> and what a history this place has. It was hand built by Philip Kaplow. So tonight, I'm inviting you to join us on what I consider to be an intimate journey of self-discovery, as Stephen and Henry are gonna delve into a topic that may blow your mind. How did Zen Buddhism start? From the Pali Canon of Buddha, to pre-Buddhist India, to similarities with, are you ready for this? Greek philosophy. So there's this perennial aspect that we're going to be exploring, the imminent, transcendent ground of all being. With that, I bring you Henry and Stephen. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chris. Huh. <laughs> Where should we start? Where should we start? Well, the, the topic is going back to the source. And um, I guess you know that I've trained as a Buddhist monk in different traditions, uh, including the Zen tradition in Korea. And one of the reasons that I trained in Zen is because I wanted to really connect with the, you know, the source of my own questioning, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, what it means to be human. And Buddhism, as a historical religious tradition, is basically an extended answer to that question. But I think very often when you uh, tease out the answer, you sometimes lose the question. And you become more interested in perpetuating a set of answers yeah. than actually reconnecting with the core of your own life, which is the fundamental koan, the That's fundamental it. question. That's so, it. That's exactly how we do it in Zen, as you know. I mean, fun, the, one of the um, three essentials of Zen that were formulated by Da Wei in the ten hundreds is precisely what he called the great doubt. Mm -hmm. And he said, you know, where there's great doubt, there's great awakening. You can't miss it. And the great doubt means the great question. It means fundamentally um, sort of settling down within, looking within and asking, who am I and what is this? Mm -hmm. What is this experience that, I'm, that I am apparently having and who is the I who's having it? Mm -hmm. So that's, I mean, I can totally relate to mm -hmm. your view on Zen in that regard, that it's much more about the question than about any answer. And one of the things we see again and again in Zen uh, law, Zen uh, history, and of course in the koan, is a master offering a putative kind of an answer only to take it away again. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a, a classic case is, is Basso or Mazu, who used to teach, you, you know, your very mind, that's Buddha. And he said, uh, he was asked once, why do you teach that way? And he says, well, it's just something I say to stop babies from crying. Mm. <laughs> and then he was asked, well, what do you say when they've stopped crying? And he said, then I say, no mind, no Buddha. What's interested me, though, um, is that I resonate very deeply with uh, that kind of language. Um, but it often feels that the early Buddhist tradition in India doesn't speak that way at all. And we think of this sort of thing as, as, as very typically Zen. Mm -hmm. And my sense of being a, a Buddhist, a follower of the Buddha, um, is not restricted merely to my Zen practice. And in fact, most of my work 
uh, in the last years has actually been about going back to another source, and that is the earliest record we have of what the Buddha said. Now, you won't find uh, in any of the discourses or the, of the Pali Canon um, statements like great doubt, great awakening. So, are they missing something? I don't think so. I think that what we often uh, miss sight of in the early canon is that everything the Buddha says is actually um, his own authentic response to the questions that arose for him as a young person. And in the legend of the Buddha, uh, as we know well, this means growing up in a life of privilege and then one day going outside of the palace and seeing a corpse, seeing an old person, seeing a sick person, seeing a wandering monk, and on each occasion realizing, or in a sense seeing as a reflection in those uh, people, um, the question of his own life. And it was when he'd, he'd witnessed, as it were, uh, that he would die, he would get sick, he would grow old. His life at that moment became a question for him. And the years he then spent doing different kinds of meditation and, and so forth and so on were basically an ongoing an attempt to, to come to terms with, to reconcile, to resolve this question. And I can only understand his awakening uh, under the Bodhi tree, as we all know, as essentially his response to that koan. Mm. And when he starts to teach, he is essentially teasing out and explicating what his response was. But Buddhism, as I've already said, when it becomes a religious institution, gets preoccupied with the answers and very often lose sight of the question. Right, right. Well, the word awakening, in, as, as we understand it in the line that I'm in, um, is an interesting matter because mm -hmm. um, in traditional Zen, there's a sort of a view that there kind of is something to go through. There is a kind of shift that can happen in our consciousness. Mm. Um, and, a, a, you know, what we might call, say, a moment of awakening, you know, a mm -hmm. sudden glimpse of another, well, not really of anything, <laughs> really not of anything. And if you look at the stories of the old masters, I mean, for example, Master Kyogo, who um, was a student of Isan, and he was given a question by Isan, which was, what is your original face before your parents were born? Show me who you are from before the time your parents were born, right now. And he s went and studied his scriptures, trying to find an answer, and he couldn't find one, and he was distraught and spent a few nights up all night trying to find something that he could bring back to his hand. Eventually he goes back and says, I can't find an answer. And um, Isan actually says, well, I could tell you, but it wouldn't do you any good. I could give you an answer, but it wouldn't help you. So then he goes off very despondent and becomes an itinerant laborer. And years later, he's taking care of a shrine in the countryside somewhere. Mm -hmm. And um, he flick, while he's sweeping the yard, he flicks a pebble against a stalk of bamboo and it makes a knock, a little knock. Ping. Ping. <laughs> you know, one knock, actually. And when he hears it, something happens. So, so what happens? You know, he's, he's changed, according to the Zen records, he's changed totally by that moment and he's then, you know, becomes a master and so on. What actually happens in that moment? Well, he doesn't say, um, you know, I have now found X, I have now attained Y. He simply says in his verse commemorating the moment, he says, I've forgotten everything I ever knew. Mm. I now don't know anything, <laughs> basically. You know, I mean, and I think he really means everything, you know, the, the whole world and all my views of it are gone. And, and even the me that I thought I knew mm. is gone. So the, the, the what, what would we call it, the, you know, the insight, the revelation, the epiphany, is not into a new known. It's more a dismantling of knowing. 
Mm -hmm. And I think this is, I mean, it, that's how we see it in the line I'm in. And, it's, and it's, a, it's really important because it can turn very easily, that kind of moment can turn into a kind of a thing and then become another kind of attachment. And then in a sense, we're sort of back to square one. Mm -hmm. So the, the old map of Zen known as the ox herding pictures with 10 stages, it, um, the first four are really concerned with sort of seeing, well, having this kind of release and becoming, in a sense, sort of, you might say, stable in it, in that reconstructing doesn't happen as much. Mm. But then the next six pictures are concerned with getting rid even of that, mm. so that there really isn't anything left to hold mm. on to. Yeah. It's just... I'm a little bit thirsty now. <laughs> and it's very nice to be with you, Stephen. By the yes, way. Henry, it's great. Um, <laughs> yeah. Well, you see, curiously, or maybe not curiously, uh, the oldest account we find in the uh, Pali texts that where the Buddha recounts his awakening, it's in the, uh, uh, the, the discourse on the noble quest. Mm -hmm. And uh, the paragraph in which he, he, he talks of this, he says that... Um, it's very difficult for people who love, delight, and revel in their place to see this ground, the ground of conditioned arising, contingency, life, and to see this ground, nirvana, the, which is the falling away of reactivity. So, his, likewise, uh, he does not describe his awakening in terms of coming to know something. The word to know, with the root jnya, in Pali Sanskrit, doesn't occur in this passage. The awakening is described on the one hand as a coming to see something, mm -hmm. and on the other hand, and I think this is probably the main point, as a radical shift in perspective. In other words, a shift in perspective from where one is preoccupied with what he calls his, your place, and by that it means everything we identify with you know, your nation, your social position, your belief system, your uh, political views. As long as you're preoccupied with that stuff, you cannot see your ground. So the Buddha's awakening was not a sudden revelation of a, a privileged knowing about the nature of reality. Uh, he doesn't mention that at all. He talks about letting go of a certain kind of preoccupation with me and my stuff and my position in order to see the ground, one's own ground, the ground, as it were, of life, of being itself. And that ground is twofold. On the one hand, it's the, uh, the process of contingency in life itself, uh, which of course is not actually much like a ground at all. If anything, it's a groundless ground. It's again this idea of something total drops away. Your sense of position and certainty, it falls away. And what you fall into is not some other permanent state like, you know, God or something, right. but contingency itself, yeah. which is bottomless, which is fluid, which is uh, constantly unfolding. And that ground is seen from the perspective of this very difficult term, nirvana, which here simply means uh, the stopping of reactivity the stopping of grasping and hating and fearing. Mm -hmm. And that, to me, is very close, mm -hmm. in fact, to what you just said about your Zen master. So, to me, the traditions meet mm -hmm. in these kind of fundamental experiences. And the history of Buddhism is a sense in the history of, of consolidating those uh, views until they become so sort of rigid and fixed mm -hmm. that they cease to serve their function any longer. And that brings up a counter-movement and the origins of, of Chan, Zen, in China are basically a return to the source. They're a dropping of the Buddhist metaphysics, of all of the, the power structures of these great monasteries, and they're returning to exactly what the Buddha did all those years ago, just sit down and come to terms with who you are, what is going on, and that's, I think, both the, the alpha and the omega, to use Christian terminology, of the whole uh, practice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Beautiful. 
Well, that's exactly what we do here, <laughs> here in the Zendo. Um, we don't really have very elaborate practices in Zen. You know, there's no visualization, there's no mantras, mm -hmm. there's, no, um, there's no gradual practice, actually. We don't build it up step by step. We actually, um, we sort of go cold turkey. <laughs> We're just sort of thrown on the cushion and be still and, you know, and see what happens. Um, in fact, Master, um, who was it? Master um, Zwigan. No, he was asked, how, how are the stages of practice ordered? He said, they're not ordered. And they, the monk said, well, why are they not ordered? And he said, because there are no stages of practice. <laughs> <laughs> it's all right here now. There's nothing more to be found mm -hmm. than just this. And yet, and yet, can we actually sort of receive this? Or have we got so many opinions about it? I mean, the third Chinese ancestor, So San, you know, he said, all, all you do in this practice is discard opinions. Mm -hmm. you know, discard opinions pro and con, basically. That's all you do. That's all there is to be done. And so this actually, what you were just saying mm -hmm. about, uh, I forget your word, but sort of cessation of reactivity or yeah, the dropping the, the reactivity. fading away the dropping of reactivity right right well this mm. is exactly what mm. Sosan is talking about in the Shinjin Mei mm -hmm. his famous poem on having faith in mind yeah. they're just mind itself mm -hmm. experience itself consciousness mm -hmm. itself is it now I don't know whether um, uh, well this is exactly the moment to, but I want to just point out something quite that struck me as quite remarkable as somebody who comes from a rather classical educational background. I grew up studying Latin from the age of nine and Greek from the age of 11 and started a PhD on Homer, which I never finished. Um, <laughs> but um, Plato actually talked about the, um, the destroying of hypotheses, mm -hmm. just getting rid of or, you know, doing away with Mm. theories or hypotheses or what we might call views yeah. of how yeah. things are which is rather interesting that, that, that <coughs> there too in Greek philosophy mm -hmm. which was much more um, practical in yeah. a sense than modern philosophy you know it's all ab about how to live mm -hmm. finding how to be happy essentially mm -hmm. how to, or at least how to be at peace we might say how to be at peace with the way things are even there um, which somehow I was certainly schooled to think of as rationalist while something like Zen was very, not, very much not rationalist. It was kind of crazy mystical stuff, you know, uh, as opposed to a cornerstone of Western mm. rationalism, you know. But actually, remarkably... It's already there. That, that it's already there. Yeah. Well, as you're speaking, uh, two things come to mind. First um, is this idea of uh, Nagarjuna, um, the great second century uh, Buddhist uh, philosopher. But again, we need to think philosopher in that original Greek sense of a real love of wisdom where you, you actually transform your life. But he understands uh, emptiness, which is often raised up as a very difficult metaphysical idea. He says um, uh, the Buddha's... Uh, say that emptiness is letting go of opinions. It's letting go of views. Believers in emptiness, he says, are incurable. <laughs> so I don't think it's an accident that Nagarjuna is also within the lineage of the Chan Zen tradition. This is, I think, the same idea. Now it's often thought also that uh, early Buddhism, particularly when it's thought of as you know, the sort of the Abhidharma and the Theravada doctrines and so on, um, is a very much a classic example of the sort of gradual path that Zen rebelled against. But once again, if we go back to one of the earliest uh, uh, statements, it's almost a slogan of, the, uh, of, of early Buddhism, um, which I have no reason to doubt probably goes back to the Buddha himself. Uh, he says, um, the Dharma, which means conditionality, nirvana, the letting go of reactivity, this embrace of life, the dharma 
is clearly visible. It's sanditico, it's clearly visible, it's, it's right before your eyes. And he says it is akaliko, which uh, Bhikkhu Bodhi translates as immediate. Uh, the word, in fact, is timeless, akaliko. But what that means is that if something is clearly visible here and now, you don't need a sequence of stages in time to get to it. And so to translate the Dhamma as immediate, unmediated, clearly visible, and he says inviting, uplifting, intuited by the wise. This is a phrase that just runs again and again through the canon. Uh, nirvana is also described as clearly visible, immediate, inviting, uplifting, intuited by the wise. Right. Now this could come out of a Zen text. Yeah. Yeah. So what I find, uh, again, is you go back th through the origins of Zen. You go back into Nagarjuna's philosophy. You go back to the most original sections of the early canon and we come very much to this, this very primordial, very, in a sense, non-conceptual um, uh, opening one's eyes and being, in a sense, dumbstruck mm -hmm. by the fact that there's anything happening at all. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there you get mm -hmm. to, again, this sense of wonder, yeah. which is at the root of Aristotle, yeah. uh, Plato. They both recognize that the origin of philosophy is wonder. It's a sense of being astonished, yeah. a sense of waking up to the fact that you're here rather than not exactly. here. Exactly. And I would take that also yeah. to be what the Buddha was awakened to on seeing sick person, old person, corpse. What that shocked him, mm -hmm. I believe, into uh, understanding was, shit, I'm alive. Yeah. What yeah. the hell does this mean? Exactly. What is this about? Yeah. And then to stay with that question, essentially, you know, for six years, to struggle with that question. There's a wonderful Zen expression which, which says you should gnaw on your question like as though you're chewing a metal rod, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, <laughs> which is a rather horrible idea. But it very much communicates this sense of uh, unconditioned urgency. Yeah, yeah. Unconditioned urgency. Yeah. Dar Wei said um, it's, it's the, the point we, in one of the upaya or hopefully skillful means that we use in Zen is koan study. And he said going deeply into a koan is like a, um, a kind of trap they used to have for rats, an ox horn trap. They'd put a little bit of sweet oil at the, deep inside the tip of the ox horn and the rat would force itself in mm -hmm. further and further and further trying to get to the sweet oil until it was stuck and couldn't get out. And, and the idea being that we're getting um, more and more sort of uh, stuck in our question, that the fundamental question, exactly as you say, of what is this, who am I, what is this experience going on right now? The koan is a means to, in, to investigate that, but it's not really so much to investigate it as simply to get stuck in it. Mm. And through being stuck, I mean, rather like Kyogen, stuck with a question about the original face, he couldn't resolve it and he also couldn't let it go. Mm. But because we're so thwarted, because we're so stuck, it can happen in that, that we actually, as it were, suddenly discover the nature of stuckness. Mm. But it's not what it seemed. The, the very stuckness is, it turns into a kind of great freedom. Mm -hmm. Now, what is the nature of that freedom? I'm, I'm, I'm going to pick up a little bit, not as, quite as elegantly as I, I, I would like to, but on what you were saying about um, Nagarjuna, that one of Nagarjuna's most well-known um, statements is his so-called fourfold negation, that you can say of a thing that it, neither is nor is not, nor both is and is not, and nor neither is nor is not. In other words, you can't say of it uh, anything final. Now, obviously, this 
flies right in the face of sort of our ordinary conditioned way of thinking that something is here or is not here. Something is either this hand or, or is everything else that's not this hand. And he's precisely, so actually in, in, in logic, you know, there is a term, the, the law of the excluded middle. That, you know, if it's A, it's A, and if it's not A, it must not be a. a. So A and not A are mutually exclusive. exclusive. There is no middle. The law of the excluded mm. middle. But what Nagarjuna is saying completely mm. breaks that down. And I wonder whether, and this is a bit speculative, mm. but it seems to me that the nature of the freedom that we can find through Zen training is something like a sort of secret capacity mm. of that mm. excluded middle. Yeah. But if we, and this is why so many masters actually talk about, about the training as, as fundamentally impossible. It's completely here, completely Im apparent, as he says, in plain sight, and yet somehow it's impossible mm. to get there. If you go towards it, you go against it, said Nansen. Mm -hmm. Yakusan said, a calf must be born of a bull. But how's that going to happen? Because, you know, the view of yes and no, is and is not, either is or is not, is so sort of absolute to us yeah. that how do we possibly release it? And, of course, that goes with a view of basically a me on board in here, mm -hmm. in this skin bag. There's a captain or something or... <laughs> or a, little, a little manager, a little <laughs> troublemaker, <laughs> a little tyrant called me, you know, who's looking out at everything else. There's me and not me. And so how is this law of the excluded middle transcended? Mm -hmm. Well, somehow, apparently, it truly can be. We, you know, we, our, our human consciousness is endowed with a capacity to transcend it or, or to see it in a radically new way yeah, by which right. it's transcended. Mm. And that brings, um, I mean, this is all pragmatic, remember, it does bring a great freedom to a human being as well as, and it makes a lot of changes. I, I really mm. feel, well, my wife thinks it has made a lot of changes in me, so <laughs> I'm happy to <laughs> hope she's right. <laughs> well, it's, um, again, I'm going to, bring this further back uh, to an earlier source still. Uh, there's one uh, discourse, only one discourse, that Nagarjuna cites by name in the Mula Madhyamaka Karikas, the verses on the middle way. And that's the Kachanagota Sutta. The Kachanagota Sutta is in the Pali Canon. And this is what it says. This is the text he's, that he refers to. He says, uh, the Buddha is asked by Kachanagota, um, you know, what is uh, complete vision or right view as it's sometimes translated? And the Buddha's reply is, uh, for the most part, people in this world uh, are, um, are trapped in the duality of it is and it is not. But for one who sees with complete wisdom or intelligence the arising of the world, there is no it is not. And for one who with complete intelligence sees the ceasing of the world, there is no it is. So the root of Nagarjuna's vision, which then is expanded in Zen, again goes back to these early sources uh, we find in Pali. So the, uh, the vision the Buddha is inculcating mm -hmm. is a vision in which we let go uh, of, as you say, uh, the grammar of ordinary language, the law of the excluded middle, either is or is not. When you experience life as it is unfolding with what, what he calls samapanya, complete intelligence, an intelligence that's not restricted by the law of the excluded middle, you find that life, the, the coming and going of, of, of experience and things, is not reducible to either it is or it is not. That language is incapable 
of capturing the uh, fluid um, process of what we call life itself. So again, it's a letting go of a very deeply embedded habit of mind that probably is, is a consequence of language, which is a consequence of the human brain having grown to a certain size and having become self-aware and having come to be able to represent itself. So the challenge of Zen, the challenge of Nagarjuna, the challenge of the Buddha is actually to transcend something which is not just you know, a, a bad mental habit, mm. but actually something that's deeply and structurally rooted in how human beings have evolved. And this is why it's called the great matter, for example, in Zen. Uh, this is what we're dealing with, and in a sense we're already contradicting ourselves by talking about it and having this conversation. Uh, we're, we're going into is and is not and all of that, so we can't help ourselves. Mm -hmm. And Zen, although it says to be beyond, what is it, how does it go? It's a direct transmission from mind to mind, no dependence on words and scriptures. Yeah. Which Buddhist tradition has produced the most scriptures? Oh, I know. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, no. It's shameful. <laughs> it's a disgrace. So, but it's not a disgrace. It's a recognition that we are linguistic beings. And as such, we're able to entertain these ideas. We're able to you know, read these texts. We're able to follow these instructions. And this brings us to... May I just... Yes. Before we go there. The, 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 it's a, it, it is really a matter of using language to go beyond language. Yeah. That's exactly. what many, many koans are basically doing. Mm -hmm. The verbal formulations, yes, they're often enigmatic, inscrutable, and frankly infuriating. <laughs> but actually, they contain a tremendous power mm. and a tremendous compassion. Mm. You know, they're, they're, they're all, most koans, and there's, I mean, in the line I'm in, we study something like 670. And they're all supposedly, rec all at some time or other, helped somebody be precisely mm. released mm. from is and is not, from I and everything else. Um, so they contain, in a sense, they contain that potential. Um, so yeah, there's one other thing I want to say. <laughs> that this impossible release, um, actually, interestingly, is picked up or expressed rather beautifully in a Christian work, The Cloud of Unknowing, yeah, right. 14th century mystical mm. manual, basically. Mm. And its author, who's not known, mm. at one point says, the work of how long does the work of God take? The work of God uh, takes only an atom. Mm -hmm. And an atom was the smallest unit of time that they mm -hmm. had. It was one sixty-fourth of a second. Mm -hmm. That it's just that small, that little shift that's basically sort of made of nothing. It's one molecule or one mm -hmm. proton jumps and suddenly it happens. And this is like... Um, Again, Sosan, who said, just a hair's breadth of separation, mm -hmm. and it's the distance between heaven and earth. Mm -hmm. Just one little tiny grain of a sense of separation, presumably mm -hmm. caused by the thought of me, mm -hmm. and I'm excluded, actually. I'm mm -hmm. kept out of, of, a, of a kind of um, ground, the groundless mm -hmm. ground. Mm -hmm. that, that will put me back in my place. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Not in this groundless ground. And actually, in, another Yakasan again said something like, I can't find one square inch to stand on mm -hmm. anywhere. Yeah. Well, Lynchy talks of, the, of, of, um, of, of leaning on nothing. Right. And Bodhi, Bodhidharma <laughs> comes in to the emperor, having spent... Uh, three years travelling from India to China at the age of 127. Yeah. And, <laughs> and the emperor asks him, what, what's the highest, holiest truth? And he just says, nothing holy, vast, void, or clear and empty, or vast and clear, nothing. And, what does, and then the emperor says, and who are you then? Exactly. And Bodhidharma says, I don't know. That's right. <laughs> 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 and actually it starts with the emperor saying, I've been a great sponsor of Buddhism. Mm -hmm. I've built all these temples and monasteries. I've funded and mm -hmm. sponsored many monks. How much merit have I acquired? <laughs> Bodhidharma says, no merit whatsoever. <laughs> <laughs> 
it's not in that system of merit acquisition leading to another life and another life and gradually working your way up until maybe you can be a monk and then maybe you can have a, a auspicious enough birth mm -hmm. that you'll attain nirvana. It's not in that system. Mm -hmm. it's, it's right here now and it always is and yet it is still hard, hidden in plain sight. Yeah. Well, again, I mean, one impression I think we've already been perpetuating largely in this conversation is that this is material that is highly distinctive of, of Zen, of Nagarjuna, of Buddhism, it's Eastern mysticism, uh, it's something quite foreign to our own tradition. We've already alluded to Plato and Aristotle, but we have to remember that there was another movement in Greek philosophy that started with a man called Pyrrho of Elis, uh, who was a philosopher. He was uh, influenced by people like Democritus, who was one of the early atomists. But the important thing that had happened to Pyrrho was that he was invited by Alexander the Great to join his army, which was setting out to conquer the Persian Empire, uh, which it did. And Alexander did not think of himself as a, just a kind of money-grubbing warlord. He saw, him, uh, he saw himself as a, as a civilizing influence. Yeah. A philosopher a in arms. A philosopher in arms. Yeah. And so he brought philosophers with him, one of whom was Pyrrha. And the Greek records describe how when they got to India, Pyrrho studied with the gymnosophists, uh, which li literally means the naked sages. Probably that means sages who didn't wear as many clothes as the Greeks did. Whether they were literally stark, as we don't know. Uh, I, I doubt it. Uh, but in any case, when Pyrrho uh, returned to Greece, uh, he established uh, the school of scepticism. And one of the few fragments uh, that survives uh, from his uh, school um, is this statement where he says that um, uh, our senses and our language cannot be trusted. They cannot communicate truth. They cannot communicate falsity. That we need to um, recognize that things no more are than they are not. That they neither both <laughs> are and are not. Yeah. And they neither it always gets complicated. This you, you did it very well. Yeah. Neither are nor not are. Yeah. Now, um, this, of course, is the famous tetralemma mm -hmm. that we find in Nagarjuna and we find also in the early canonical texts of Buddhism. Pyrrho, like the Indian uh, gymnosophists that he would have studied with, certainly like the early Buddhists, did not see that um, realization that we cannot speak of these things, we cannot know anything with certainty, simply as a kind of you know, intellectual or academic insight. He says by allowing the mind to come to rest in that radical uncertainty, that radical unknowing, leads to what he calls aphatos, which means speechlessness. And aphatos leads to ataraxia. Ataraxia literally means untroubledness, uh, a deep peace, perhaps. But like we find in Buddhist language, he, he too uses negatives to affirm what is, it's not this, not this. Uh, it is not, it is, not is not. And although there's still a scholarly debate going on as to whether this idea had its origins in India or whether this idea was already there somewhere in Greece, the jury is still out on that. Right. But the important point for me is that Pyrrho, the founder of the school we now call skepticism, is very likely, in my opinion, uh, to have had his core awakening through his encounter with Indian tradition. Whether or not he went Buddhist as such, we don't know. Right. But the point is, Pyrrho was, like the sages of India, someone who sought to put this teaching into practice. Right. Philosophy meant to uh, radically change the way you live in the world. Right. It wasn't just getting you know, a good understanding. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so what I'm 
think of when we now go back to the source, not of Zen and Buddhism and Nagarjuna, mm -hmm. we go back to the source of our own tradition. Right. We go back to the source of the kind of inquiry that eventually led to the European Enlightenment, right. the Renaissance. Right. People like Montaigne in the 16th century were trying to practice Pyrrhonism. So when Buddhists today read the essays of Montaigne, they say, hey, that's kind of Buddhist. <laughs> there might be a good reason for that. Right. Yeah, well, we, we have inherited a, a misconception about the division of Eastern, Eastern and thought West. and Western thought. Mm -hmm. It's quite remarkable, actually. I mean, not only, I mean, Alexander, I mean, set up the, you know, the, an empire, the, a single political entity that included much of Western India and Greece in a single entity. Prior to that, there were two Persian empires, both of which included a, a piece of India and a piece of the Eastern Greek territories, mm -hmm. already back in the 6th century BC. Mm -hmm. So there's been... the What happened, I think, in the West is that um, European imperial colonialism needed to believe that classical mm -hmm. Greece was a kind of humanist miracle without precedent because it justified European superiority. What M.A. says are called the white man superiority complex. Mm -hmm. But because of that, it was fine for us to go about the world subjugating peoples because we were the inheritors of something that hadn't happened anywhere else, which was a kind of humanist enlightened revelation, basically, mm -hmm. that that was encapsulated in Athens in the 5th century, something like that. But actually, that story really leaves out an enormous fact, which is that Greece itself had been linked not only through the polity of the Persian Empire, but through trade that now is thought to have been far more extensive yeah. than previously believed. And... But it, the, the idea that there were these two parallel worlds that knew nothing about each other is, is just a great falsehood. That's a total fiction. Yeah, and I mean, we, we um, um, I find that deeply reassuring. I mean, one of the things that used to sort of bother me a bit when I got into Zen in the first place was that my dad, who was a thoroughly rational Oxford professor, you know, would be, he was just sort of supportive. Uh, uh, he was a very kind guy, was supportive of everybody, basically, including his son, um, of doing this strange thing called Zen. Um, but that it seemed really foreign and exotic. Mm -hmm. And I would try to explain it, and I'd see his eyes glazing over. <laughs> and so I'd say, yeah, but what is it? You know? <laughs> say, well, you know, you meditate, and you, you know, what's that? You know, why that? Anyway, I try to explain. He'd never really um, bought it, you know. And, um, and yet, why did it feel so natural, so sort of somehow intrinsic to being human and not foreign at all? Mm -hmm. It made me feel much less foreign, actually. You know, in fact, helped me discover a very deep kind of belongingness, yeah. you know, in the family of things, mm. you know, which I'd never had. And I thank Zen for that, my Zen teachers, of course. Um, so to discover that there are, in fact, possible, maybe a bit speculative, but possible shared roots, or at least shared exchange, going right back into the beginnings of the Greek miracle, and Buddhism, I find very reassuring that we're not doing something that strange after all. We're not doing anything exotic and foreign, really, at all. No, I think the same. I think that uh, what might be the, in a sense, the long-term outcome of the current interest in, in Buddhism in the West is not uh, discovering that Buddhism is another exclusive and superior tradition. Um, it took sort of a counter move to European superiority. We now raise up everything Asian. Uh, but actually will be 
um, a, a means whereby we come to recover our, the common roots of our humanity. I couldn't agree more. And um, what is weird, though, um, although you're right, European Enlightenment, European thinkers think of Greece as the beginning of all these, uh, of our specialness. When you go back to look at the Greek histories that the Greeks wrote at the time, they had long believed that philosophy came from India. This was a, is it already in the text? Uh, they already, uh, they also, there's this story that goes back an awful long time that the god Dionysus was banished from Greece and exiled to India. And um, when Alexander arrived uh, in what is now Pakistan, um, according to one record at least, he met Greek communities. Mm -hmm. What is perhaps even more striking is that there is one discourse in the Pali Canon, the Asalayana Sutta, the discourse to Asalayana, in the middle length discourse, is where the Buddha is debating with a Brahmin uh, the Brahmin is saying, you know, people are born uh, and there is a divinely ordained caste uh, system uh, that is I immutable. And the Buddha says, but look at the outlying countries like the Yona and Cambodia. Yona is Ionia, yeah. Greece. Yeah. In Ionia, in Greece, they have two classes, masters and slaves. And they're thoroughly interchangeable. This is in the Pali Canon, a reference right. to Greece. Right. Uh, the, the probably Greek communities yeah. that could have been the descendants of the followers of Dionysos who were already settled in the Punjab. Uh, we know, for example, also in terms of the extraordinary distances uh, people are able to cover, the early Greek records uh, all agree that at the Battle of Thermopylae, which was took place a hundred and... I think 100 miles west of Athens mm -hmm. in 480 BCE had, um, this was the Persian attempt to conquer Greece, in the Persian army were Indian soldiers, elephants, people from basically the Punjab. Right. We even further back, when Darius I wanted to expand the Persian Empire further east into Gandhara, he sent um, scouts, we'd call them now. This was in 520 BC. The Battle of Thermopylae, by the way, took place in the year the Buddha was born. But 40 years before then, Darius employed a Greek called Skylax of Karyanda mm -hmm, mm -hmm. to go and, 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 and check the river systems of the Indus to see where the Indus came out in the sea mm -hmm. in order to prepare for the invasion. Modern scholarship is a, a Russian scholar who's looked into the work of uh, Skylax and has found it's very likely, in fact, that he even went as far as the Ganges, went out into the Bay of Bengal, down to Sri Lanka and back. So all of this shows that, you know, as you say, uh, the cross-traffic of, um, of trade, of ideas, of um, cultures, of movements of men and women, of armies, of people, was going on long before the Buddha. Right, right. So we, it, 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 uh, it uh, disrupts and undermines this whole notion of the, the East and the West. Exactly. That, I think, is, is a language that's just passed its cell by date right. and needs to just be dropped. Right. And this is really sort of hopeful, I mm -hmm. find, for the future of... Maybe we'll just call it meditation practice. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Zen basically means meditation, mm -hmm. right? So that we, that we don't need to be inheritors of religious institutions that aren't very congenial to us. Many of us who have come to something like Zen don't particularly want religious institutions anyway. We may have had, you know, unhappy experiences of patriarchal, Hiera whatever the word hierarchical hierarchical structures structures we don't like it and and find it you know, it's rampant with hypocrisy for example mm. and so on so maybe there will be a new formation that's bubbling up already mm. that takes what 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 is what is essential of the Zen tradition mm. I, I believe Zen does have a huge amount to offer us here and now as we are, 
precisely because it's so focused on, on this moment and simply surrendering to it, studying it, coming at it in a number of ways, to have uh, a more intimate mm. relationship with, with life. Yeah. You know? and, but actually, if we can sort of know that we're, we're, we're open also to our own tradition, mm. the roots of our own tradition, which are, which are basically deeply sceptical and questioning. It's the mm. same thing. I mean, you know, this is maybe a bit glib, but the Socratic method is questioning. Mm. You know, and scepticism is about questioning and doubting. And the root of the word is doubt. Mm. You know, that if we can find a way to sort of evolve and accommodate, uh, well, really, sort of the study of who we are and how to be in a better way. Mm. You know, I mean, and if that study can incorporate um, or at least sort of send roots down into what are, in a sense, are, really are already our own cultural roots. And meanwhile, we've got a practice that's allowing us to sort of tap into our, our, the roots of being human, mm. in a sense, of just what it is to be human, have a human consciousness in a human body in a web of relationships, mm. and to find that actually there's a great um, foregoing web of relationship mm. that, that has been doing this in known and lesser known ways for thousands of years, mm. and that we can, we can learn from their <laughs> trial and error, basically. Yeah. You know, I mean, I find that a very, very hopeful vision for all of us, mm -hmm. I mean, I hope we're around long enough to, as a species, to see it happen. But if we are, I think it's rather exciting. I think it's exciting. I think also, if I were a younger person today, um, you know, I would feel, you know, a much greater affirmation in terms of belonging to a global community. If I had a philosophy, a practice, a way of life that wasn't um, identified, you know, with either West or East. Uh, in some ways, I think those of us in our generation are basically, uh, we're, a, we're a, a transitional phase, right. I think. I think our lives in modernity, uh, particularly, you know, recent modernity where uh, Buddhist and Hindu and Sufi ideas and so on have began to sort of really take root in our culture. Uh, I think that's a transitional phase. And I think, you know, reluctantly as we might personally be, I think we have to also be able to be willing to let go yeah. of Zen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, <laughs> to no, let I'm... go of yeah. the Pali Canon or whatever and cease to sort of give it such unquestioning authority. Yeah. Because what we're facing as a, as a human community is we're, 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 we're now, especially with things like the internet, it's impossible not to feel part of a, of a global village as McLuhan mm -hmm. presciently saw in the 1960s. And the kind of response that we're going to have to rise to, particularly if uh, you know, climate change de degrades the quality of life, triggering enormous social, political upheavals, which will initially affect the less privileged mm -hmm. on this planet. We're going to have to tap very deep not into our own sectarian or into our own uh, European or Asian traditions. We're going to have to go beyond that. We're going to have to somehow tap into a common source. We're going to have to return, really, uh, to what it means fundamentally to be a human creature um, inhabiting this earth. Right, right. So I feel hopeful, but I don't feel complacent. <laughs> At all. Beautifully put. Yeah. Well, you know, funnily enough, Alexander the Great had a kind of <laughs> utopian ideal uh -huh. of what he called homonoia, which means basically like mindedness. Oh. Noia, mind, and homo, same. Like. Yeah. And, he, and it was expressly that the eastern parts of the empire, India, and the middle part, the Near East, as they call it, the mm. Persian, and so on, and the West, the Greek world, would all have ultimately homonoia, one mind. Mm. And 
philosophy was his hope mm -hmm. for that coming about, which is rather like my master's master, Yamada Cohen, mm -hmm. who passionately believed that you know, all human beings have the same fundamental nature, mm -hmm. which can only be found when you really let go yeah. of, of, of all the things we've been talking about. And in that nature, he said, it isn't really anything. And yet, to find it, that is the hope for the human race, he mm. thought. But of course, we have to go beyond humans now. <laughs> yeah. um, uh, and I've always been struck by how in the early Buddhist, and certainly in Mahayana Buddhism, there's this constant emphasis not on the whole of humanity, but on sabasatta, all sentient beings. Mm -hmm. And, and that, I think, is the kind of uh, commonality, the kind of identity we, I think, are called upon now to, to realize that it's not, you know, the, the, the humans are just one of many species. A relatively recent arrival on the scene who's wreaked an incredible amount of damage. Mm. And I think what these practices and what this philosophy might um, lead to is not a sort of a, a, a common humanity or humanism, but actually to a really heartfelt identity with everything that lives and breathes on this earth. Yes, um, maybe we could stop there. Yeah, I, I was going to suggest. Yeah.